Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you so much for listening. And on the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, including places like uh, Zone Coverage, Cover 32. Uh, he is useful human Arif Hassan. Arif, how you doing today? I'm good. How are you? It's, uh, it's a bit of an odd week for Lake Wobegon up here. The uh, the big news is that a bear decided to walk into town and hang out in University Park for a little while. And the entire town decided to come check it out because they've either never seen a bear or it was just a nice day and decided to walk to the park. What is bear? What is bear? <laughs> bear is driving? How can this be? <laughs> so there's this big bear that... For the three people who've seen the Clerks animated uh, TV show. Uh, so there's this big uh, bear that was hanging out in, in the trees, and they had to put it down because they couldn't like successfully bring it down from the tree that it had climbed up on. So the whole community is up in arms because they have nothing better to complain about than about this bear and trying to keep him alive. So, yeah, that's, that's the big news up here because there's nothing else. <laughs> Just bear. So I actually was listening to NPR yesterday, um, and they switch over to like Canadian NPR, which is like CBC or something like that, uh, at like eleven or midnight or something. I was driving back from the uh, Football Machine podcast, and um, it was it was so obviously it was like Canadian you know broadcast radio, and it's in the middle of this guy explaining how he survived a bear attack. Uh, which like would have been fascinating, except I got into the middle of this conversation. And so I didn't know that he was surviving a bear attack. He was just talking about being beat up by this woman. And he's like describing her in very weird ways. And I couldn't figure it out. Right. Yeah, like she had the biggest jaw I've ever seen. Like, yeah, what right, yeah woman it was like that. This? It was like, and then she swiped at my abdomen. I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like that's that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I just like couldn't. <laughs> And she's like, I started bleeding, and I was like, oh, she must have had something in her hand. Like, she must have had a knife. I must have missed that part of the story. And she clawed like at me, and she smelled like salmon. Like, <laughs> I probably would have figured it out by then. I started figuring out when he talked about how she grabbed his skull, and I was like, that's not a normal way to talk about a fight you're having with somebody. <laughs> Uh, I mean, if you if you go back to the, like my my fallback, if you get like some sort of a facial scar or anything, is that you were in a fight with a group of bikers. So I mean, like if you were in a fight with a group of bikers, someone grabbing your skull, you could you could use that. You could yeah, say that. okay, no, yeah, yeah, that does work. Uh, and I was like, this is really weird. Uh, and like he like she ripped off like part of his scalp, and I was like, oh, she's really strong. <laughs> Man, I'm really worried for this guy. <laughs> like, uh, hopefully he didn't like start the fight, so like I can cheer for him or something. Like this is <laughs> wow. He didn't like he didn't grab her butt uh, while like she was waitressing, and then she decided to just like destroy him like a Mortal Kombat character. Yeah, right. Like in like I, I needed to reserve judgment, right? Because yeah. like I like what what happened, and then she like picked him up by the abdomen, and I was like, that's a weird way to describe yourself, but okay. And threw him across the room, and I was like, oh wow, she is like. Unless you're Gorilla Monsoon from like '90s and '80s WWF, like announcing, dis talking about how you were grabbed by a body part like that. Like I was grabbed by the solar plexus. Like yeah, right, yeah. I was like, that, <laughs> who describes their own stomach with the word abdomen? Grabbed me by the which abdomen. Which is such like an interesting like insight into the way we talk about even ourselves when we're talking about animals. Like yeah. I didn't even think about it like that. And I was like, he must be very small, and she must be very large, or both, because. Uh, people can't just pick people up by the abdomen and throw them unless one of the or unless both of them are like willing participants in this. And I was like, <laughs> uh, maybe it's an this has to be an animal, right? There's no way like this is a human. And then he talked about how uh, he hit her in the snout, and I was like, boom, animal, got it. Like, you don't <laughs> use the word snout with humans. That's the one right? way that it wouldn't be used to use to like, yeah to be described and like. But you're right. By the time like this is happening, I'd already gotten home, and I was like, "There's no way I'm like turning off the car and walking out without learning what this is." <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like, he 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 says, "Yeah." So I took two more steps back inside, which is like 
Okay, weird. Uh, this whole thing happened outside, but you could just take two steps inside. Cool. And uh, and and the bear didn't follow him in. And he's like, okay, yeah. So she's afraid of the indoors, and I closed the door, and I was like, oh, cool. End of story. Fantastic. And he's like, but I knew I needed to get back outside. And I was like, why? There's a bear that's killing you. Like, what? you're bleeding. And he's like, I had to go back outside because I needed to go to the hospital. And I was like, oh, okay. You know what? That makes sense. I'm not gonna, uh, not so- gonna wait it out a little bit. Yeah, right. He's like, I didn't, you know, want to fall asleep. I was woozy. And I was like, you're woozy and you're going to outrun a bear to your own car. That's pretty incredible. But, uh, you know, end of the story, he actually ends up doing that. The bear, uh, he like he's like he's a like horror movie fumbling for his keys to the car. Uh, and the bear notices him and please, starts charging at him. Please and he gets tell me he dropped it under the car. Like, <laughs> that's the only way this visual works. <laughs> While fumbling <laughs> with the keys, he drops the key it under the car. Like, so apparently, so the key wouldn't fit into the door or something, and he was like, "Yeah, I'd forgotten that it, it was an electronic lock." And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> I'd, I'd lost enough thing. blood where I forgot how keys worked." <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, he got into the car in time, and then he drove away, and the bear chased after the car, and he got to the hospital, and the hospital was like, "Wow, you look like you got attacked by a bear." And he was like, "Funny story." <laughs> Funny so, you should say that. Yeah. That's the story of Canadian NPR, which is a super Canadian story, I guess. <laughs> Tonight on BBC World. <laughs> so, with all of that, welcome to this episode of Norse Code, where we're going to football s- podcast ex- about football. <laughs> the football podcast about football, where we're going to be talking about camp in a manner of sorts. Uh, we'll be doing a bit of a training camp preview, along with uh, uh, talking about the lovely contents of a Reef's training camp guide, which we'll be, we will be shilling later in the show. Uh, we also have breaking news about a new Vikings signee. Um, yeah, let's go with that. And uh, we're sure. also going to be looking at the Bears offseason. So all of this. really appropriate to yeah, look at the Bears, I guess. <laughs> I like how that worked. I like how that randomly <laughs> just kind of came together. This is good. Yeah. I've, I've got a good feeling about this show. And if you have a good feeling about this show, you can go to patreon.com slash Norse code or go to paypal.me slash Norse code and you can donate a couple of bucks and keep the Loch Ness Monster at bay. Uh, we are ad free and we appreciate it and we like to remain ad free. So if again, you enjoy the show and would like to support us, you can go to paypal.me slash Norse code. Or you can go to patreon.com slash Norse code. And Patreon, of course, is more of a subscription based. You can throw a buck or two uh, per month and it'll go right to us and it helps keep the uh, helps keep the show ad free, helps keep us on the same uh, network that we've been on uh, as far as distribution and all that. So again, we really do appreciate it. We're looking at a couple of cool things down the line, so we will keep you up to date on that as soon as they happen. And again, as we had mentioned last episode, we are looking at potentially doing a live show during uh, training camp. So if you are uh, interested in this, we are looking at potential venues. Uh, to pull this off at. So if you have any information about potential venues where this would work, please either email the show at norsecodepodcast at gmail.com, or you can just message us on Twitter at norsecodedn, or you can just message a reef. So uh, all of this aside, let's start off with a bit of uh, the training camp guide. What is new and what are you really proud of this year? Uh, yeah, so uh, the training camp guide for people who are not familiar with it is a guide I put out every year that has uh, scouting reports for, uh, I usually say all 90, but I don't scout specialists. So in this case, 86 uh, players on the Vikings roster. Uh, typically it comes out in PDF, but this year we're hosting it at zonecoverage.com. It's behind the zone coverage paywall subscription, which actually means it costs less uh, than it used to by about $5. Plus you get uh, a shirt, I guess, uh, and uh, and some gift cards. So uh, it's a better deal than it ever has been. Uh, and then uh, I've got some analysis of uh, of uh, John DeFilippo's offense. I've got some analysis of like what it means to draft a, uh, a a developmental offensive tackle. And I take a look at sort of the history of of the term developmental offensive lineman and see you know where does Brian O'Neill maybe fit on that spectrum. So uh, it, it has scouting reports on everybody, which is kind of the the big main selling point. You can take a look at and see like, hey, how did CJ Ham play at fullback last year, and what can we expect from like this undrafted free agent or Richard Clea who hasn't like started, but he's been in the league for four years. I've looked at all of these players and I've written them up. I've talked about their strengths, weaknesses, and their fit with the Vikings. 
things, uh, as well as maybe like some interesting nuggets. So you can take a look at, at that over at zonecoverage.com when it goes live, uh, which hopefully it will by the time you listen to this. If it doesn't, it's very soon. Uh, and that'll be up before training camp starts. Then I'll head over there and talk about the players that I just wrote about uh, and, and how they're doing in camp. So the as far as the zone coverage paywall is concerned, can you talk a little bit about that and uh, uh, how much that's going to end up being? Yeah, sure. So if you use the promo code ARIF, so A-R-I-F, uh, that costs $20. That gives you a subscription for the entire year. Uh, and that not only gives you access to the guide, that gives you access to our exclusive draft content. Uh, I put a bunch of analytics uh, and, uh, and you know, a bunch of, like, graphs and data and charts and stuff like that. I'll also get access uh, to Luke Inman's video scouting reports. He does a bunch of really great stuff with video. Um, but it's not just NFL stuff. Uh, we've got exclusive MLB stuff, exclusive NHL stuff, uh, and soon we'll have have uh, exclusive uh, WNBA uh, and, and other sports. Um, right now we have like WNBA stuff, but uh, none of it is behind a paywall until we've got kind of enough going that we can kind of put some behind, uh, you know, a premium membership. So not only do you get access to the guide, you get access to uh, a bunch of in-depth analysis and reporting that we do across a bunch of different sports. So, Something that uh, seem that, that only Vikings Twitter seems to be caring about, and and not the front office, is the offensive line. Uh, do you have any little uh, tidbits you're willing to share about uh, the offensive line, uh, as far as uh, how it looks going into training camp? Yeah, sure. I broke down uh, some of the players that uh, that you know are potential candidates for the guard position. Um, so obviously, Mike Remmers is there. I've talked, uh, but I also talk a little bit about some of the other players that could potentially be there. Some people talked at the beginning of the off season about Tom Compton. Maybe he has the potential to start. They talked about Danny Sedora, who started for a game and then played in in two other halves of games this year. You know, what would it look like if he started? And so I talk about the scouting reports there. Um, as a kind of a tidbit, I would not be confident if uh, Isadora or Compton uh, would be starting a guard that kind of worry me a lot. Uh, and I think that both of them kind of have these technical issues that prevent them from being consistently good at guard, uh, specifically uh, the way they kind of shoot their hands inside or rather the fact that they don't. Um, they're very a lot of times when you see offensive linemen, uh, the good ones will very often uh, at the snap punch their hands inside and hit. Uh, the opponent's jersey or their numbers, uh, and uh, a lot of bad offensive linemen will will hug um, or clap their arms around to try and control the defensive linemen, and that robs them a lot of power and a lot of control. And it's a big problem that Isadora has, big problem that he had in college with Miami, although he had good pass protection numbers, and now in the NFL, both in the preseason and in his start against the Browns. So that's kind of a little tidbit about the the stuff that I look into and and what you can kind of get from it. Um, Rashad Hill at tackle is probably better than uh, than than Compton or Isadora is at guard or Colby Gossett at this point in his development. Uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised if you had Remmers at guard and Rashad Hill at tackle instead of, you know, one of those uh, you know guys at guard and, and Mike Remmers at tackle. I mentioned that simply because the uh, number of questions that we had in the mailbag this week on the offensive line, uh, despite talking about it for like the last four episodes, <laughs> it's just like... God, I wish this is the one thing that the Vikings would have really just cared about this offseason and just made a thing. You're like, you know, we have our defense is good enough. Let's let's actually make it so our quarterbacks don't have to run for their lives. You'd hope one day. Yeah, right. Maybe. Well, we'll luck into some some great guy who's going to demand, you know, excellence. It'll be fantastic. Maybe. Yeah, sure. So, uh, before we get too into this, uh, we do have some breaking news to talk about. Uh, this is, I think we should just refer to this episode as the Mike Hughes contract signing spectacular. Uh, <laughs> it's our breaking news of the show. Uh, Mike Hughes has, uh, has signed. He is our first round cornerback. And he is, uh, I believe, the last of the draft class to, uh, to sign ahead of training camp. Yeah. Um, I would say that this is because we had someone uh, tweet in a question about why Mike Hughes hasn't signed yet. So Minnesota North Star, uh, thanks to you, the Vikings have signed Mike Hughes. Yeah, so feel good about that. Uh, do we know anything about it, or is this just more in the whole, it is breaking, it is finally done, oh yeah, oh yeah? Yeah, it's basically that. Um, I imagine what had held it up. 
uh, was offsets language, uh, whether or not uh, the Vikings would be uh, liable to pay out the rest of the contract in a world where he's cut and then gets picked up by another team. Um, so that, I mean, that's usually what holds back first round contracts because there's a certain amount of money that's slotted to every player, uh, in the first round, every pick slot. Uh, and you can't, there's not really a bunch of negotiating rooms. So really what it comes down to is how much guaranteed money there is and whether or not there's offset language. There's a couple of other things, but those are kind of the two big, big sticking points. And in the first round, it's all guaranteed. So yeah. it's not really, you know, a thing you have to worry about. So offsets are basically just... If you guarantee a player, you know, twenty million dollars, right, uh, for four years, uh, and you know the first year you're they're on the roster, you pay them five million dollars, great, um, but you need to cut them after that, so you owe them fifteen million dollars um, because it's the contract they're guaranteed the additional fifteen million dollars after the first year. You cut them, another team picks them up and guarantees that player ten million dollars. Now, in a world where the player wins the negotiation in offsets language, that means he gets the full $15 million from the Vikings as well as the full $10 million from the team that just guaranteed him $10 million. In a world where the Vikings completely win that negotiation, the Vikings are only liable for the difference. So in this case, uh, Team B picks up $10 million, and then the Vikings only owe $5 million. Uh, and the degree to which uh, you know some of that con- contract has offsets language in it or whatever is usually the sticking point. And for someone late in the first round like Mike Hughes, I would imagine that they don't have their contract completely guaranteed throughout the offsets. Um, but I imagine you know they, they negotiated some sort of partial guaranteed offsets thing. So fairly standard rookie contract stuff, nothing too crazy. And for people yeah. who were thinking that he was going to be holding out, it wouldn't have made much sense to be able to do that anyway. So, yeah, it's it's fairly standard stuff, but he is signed. We do have another cornerback who is ready to play for us. Yay! Yeah. So uh, let's go on to another part of our... Uh, kind of ongoing series in looking at the uh, the NFC North, and let's look at the potential fifteen and one uh, Bears. Uh, <laughs> I want to give a special shout out. We we give him a lot of crap, but uh, Don from Ohio posted a screenshot of the uh, of this guy from was it NFL Network or was it ESPN? I'm trying to remember. Uh, it was here. NFL Network. It was NFL Network that uh, put up the big board of uh, of the schedule for the Bears. And proceeded to put them at fifteen and one. Uh, what was their one loss? Uh, so the Bears have a really tough schedule. They've got the entirety of the NFC North: so the Vikings twice, the Packers twice, the Lions twice. They've also got the AFC East, which means they have to play the Patriots. Um, and so their loss was, as you'd expect, to the Dolphins. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of all, <laughs> it's just like, what are you even doing at this point? <sighs> Yeah, it was like I was. Just, yeah, I I pulled up the the thing now. It's yeah, it's, it's NFL Network. Yeah, big win over the uh, over the Rams. Yeah, big yeah. win over the San Francisco Forty uh, ers Yep. Yeah, maybe big win against the uh, Week Seventeen Vikings if you know we rest all our starters because we're going to the playoffs. Just. I'm not saying he might be right about that, but uh, Don from Ohio had mentioned I've been clean and sober for almost 15 years, but I'll have whatever he's taking. Uh, and I agree, it must be I, pretty good. Yeah, I, this is this is amazing. I don't. So the one week they're going to lose is week six. <laughs> that's that's incredible. Well, because they don't come back from the bye well. I think is is the main thing he's trying to say because they have a week five. Oh bye. yeah, by week five. Oh, yeah, that's they, they, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I want, I want that's to know. So good. I want to know if that's the actual reason for that decision. Like that would make me so happy if that was his like actual. Well, yeah, you know, I think they really could have gone. They they really could go the whole way, but you know, if yeah, they bye weeks, man. Yeah, they just don't come back from the bye strong. You know, Trubisky is is kind of unproven out there, so I don't. I wouldn't want to give him the full sixteen wins there. Uh, we were talking before the show that what 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 I should do is just parlay each win. Just you know, bet the whole bet, bet this guy's whole like schedule, and yeah, just, just do it sequentially. Yeah, sequ- yeah, sequentially. Yeah. Think of the amount of like win I would get out of like a five dollar bet. Of just like a oh, one dollar bet, what yeah. have you set right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would go through all seventeen weeks of football. Um, 
you know, not putting anything down on the bye week, obviously, but just you know, every single week, just just make sure it parlays into the next one, and then completely ignore them in the playoffs because I don't trust them. Not yeah, reliable they're enough. Not predictable. Not predictable. That is <laughs> that is the that is the 2018 Bears for you. Not predictable enough once they make it into the playoffs. I don't, I, I just don't trust Trubisky. <laughs> <laughs> I trusted Trubisky to get me a million dollar mansion, but I just don't trust him in the first round against the Saints. I just, I just don't know. So, uh, what changes uh, have happened for the Bears this off season, and uh, can we expect a fifteen and one performance out of them? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I won't be quite as aggressive as uh, as the NFL Network was, but I do think they had a really good off season. Um, so uh, they signed Allen Robinson, who's a premier contested catch receiver, and they made Blake Bortles look really good. Um, obviously, he missed a lot of last year, but if he's healthy, uh, he's a, he's a top five. I mean, he's better than I think um, you know Diggs or Thielen are, um, and so that's you know pretty high praise coming from a Vikings podcast. He he can be a pretty incredible receiver, but we haven't seen that from him in a little bit. Regardless, I thought that was a really good pick, and then of course uh, Anthony Miller, who I mocked to the Bears at seven overall in a different podcast, like before the draft, uh, ends up coming to the bears in, in the second round, uh, really good pick. He's a, he's a really good player. I've actually seen him compared to, uh, what Kendall Wright would be if Kendall Wright turned out to be good. So that's, um, that also makes him somewhat comparable actually to Diggs, Uh, and that gives the bears, uh, you know, a little bit of leeway. They've got a deep threat in Taylor Gabriel, um, they've got kind of this long shot injury guy, Kevin White, uh, who I don't imagine will will turn it into anything. I mean, he's had like a couple of chances, but, you know, it's still there. It's still kind of a fun, exciting thing to talk. Like, what if not only do you have Allen Robinson and, and Anthony Miller, what if Kevin White, you know, he's finally figured out like he could have like a Paul Richardson kind of revival after like two years of injury or something like that. So there's that. But then also uh, you, you kind of have to appreciate they have uh, Trey Burton. Uh, and uh, they can pair him with Adam Shaheen, their second-round pick from last year. And you see you've got two tight ends that you can be pretty excited about. Both are more potential uh, than proven talent, but Trey Burton had a really good year last year as kind of the third tight end uh, for the Eagles. Um, So they've got all that going. Kyle Long is healthy again, uh, and that means you've got – you know, Kyle Long, Cody Whitehair, you've got James Daniels, who they just drafted in the second round as well. Uh, and that's a really strong interior core. Now, they've got like some problems, probably a tackle because they've got like what Bobby Massey and Charles Leno Jr. And the, I mean, that's not great, but the interior is pretty strong and, and maybe they can kind of revive the running game that they kind of fell behind after Jordan Howard's really good rookie season. Um, so they've got Jordan Howard, they've got Tariq Cohen. Uh, and those are guys that that obviously they're super excited about. Uh, Ryan Nall is is one of their undrafted free agents. He's he had this just incredible combine. He's kind of like a spark superstar. They've got him at at fullback. Um, so you know, take that for what you like. How much impact could he really have? But uh, uh, for the most part, that offense is 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 brimming with potential. Uh, and then there's a bunch of people that obviously are excited about Mitchell Trubisky. Uh, I'm, obvi- I'm I'm not. I don't think that he's a very good player. Uh, and when when you've got an offense that's brimming with potential, rarely do you see uh, them kind of pay that potential back. A lot of people, I think, when they look at the Bears, they look at some of the the best possible outcomes. Anthony Miller has, uh, you know, a, a breakout rookie season. You know, Allen Robinson is fully healthy. Mitch Trubisky takes the leap in the same way that Carson Wentz and Jared Goff did because both of them kind of had troubling. Well, Goff had more than a troubling rookie season, but both of them had worrisome rookie seasons. So, you know, they're, they're the most recent, you know, rookies. So, you know, that 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 had a second year. So now it's Trubisky's turn, which, you know, that's not a given either. Um, Trey Burton, you know, he's going to get a bunch more snaps. Is he going to be able to respond in the same way uh, to 800 snaps as he did to, I think, 400 snaps? You know, who knows, right? Um, So they've got a bunch of stuff that you can be excited about, but I think it's mostly stuff where you have to, you have to pick an interpretation and people want to pick the optimistic interpretation because that makes things more exciting and or you're a Bears fan. So that's offensively kind of what their offseason looks like. Um, I think they, uh, yeah, I think they, they only have the two draft picks on the offensive side of the ball. And then they've got kind of a lot of things going on defensively. So they drafted Roquan Smith in the first round. Uh, and that, I think, makes their linebacker core something that they can be kind of excited by. Um, so, uh, they've got Roquan Smith, obviously, and they compare him with Danny Trevathan. Trevathan was really good with the Broncos. I don't think he's really pulled it together as a Bears linebacker in the same way. Um, but a lot of people kind of remember the positive memories of Danny Trevathan. 
Uh, and when you can p- compare that with someone like Akeem Hicks, who had a really sneakily good season, um, you can kind of begin to see why you'd be excited about that front seven. I personally am not super excited about the front seven. I think uh, it's been too long since Aaron Lynch has been exciting. I mean, he hasn't been exciting since college. A lot of people are like, well, he could have been a first round pick, but then he went to Southern Florida. It's it's still been too long, I think. Uh, I don't think you can rely on Aaron Lynch to break out. I don't think Leonard Floyd is as good as, as some of his optimistic proponents say. Uh, and uh, really the strength of, of what they have is is kind of reliant on that secondary and even that, you know, you have to answer some questions in a positive way because he had a bunch of players that were finally good this year. So Kyle Fuller is maybe the best example of that, where he had the, a good first two games as a rookie, and then he's just been bad for three years. Uh, in fact, he was so bad that the Bears didn't exercise a fifth-year option on him. Uh, and so they had to sign him as a free agent after he finally had a good season. And they were right not to not to option him because he'd just been bad. Then he had a really good season. And the question is, you know, can he repeat that season? You know, I don't know. Adrian Amos had a breakout season. You know, can he repeat that? No idea. You know, uh, Eddie Jackson had a really good season as a safety. Can he repeat that? No idea. You know, some of these players that have really good seasons, if they don't have that history of uh, of, of high performance behind them, no, you can you can see that kind of being a fluke. So I would say that their secondary is kind of going to be the strength of their defense. Um, but a couple of things have to go right. Prince Mukamara has to play at a level that he hasn't played at in a while, I think, to kind of match the performance of the rest of them. Uh, and then their, uh, their draft picks are not players that you kind of expect to contribute right away. Uh, some of them I like. Kylie Fitz, for example, in the sixth round, I thought was a phenomenal move. You know, he's super athletic. He's got... Uh, I think better technical ability than a lot of people give him credit for. Um, maybe he's a little older than a lot of rookies, but this is a sixth round pick. Like, who cares? It's kind of like Ade Aruna. Uh, like, who cares? Um, so maybe, you know, he'll end up being a pretty interesting, um, you know, rotational rusher. Bilal Nichols is uh, kind of an interesting, uh, you know, nose tackle type. Um, but, you know, he's not going to change the nature of the defense. Um most of the most of the draft pick investments that they made at the back end of the defense are not that interesting. It's mostly Roquan Smith, uh, and then on offense, it's Anthony Miller and James Daniels. And after that, it's you don't have to think too much about you know what they've been doing uh, from the draft. So the biggest glaring issue this team had last year uh, was it a, was its abysmal wide receiver uh, core. Just yeah. absolutely huge, huge problem. Yeah. Absolutely awful. Um, so with the additions that they've made, do you feel like they'll be able to go into middle of the pack, or do you think they're still going to be down near the bottom? It, it really, this team really does kind of live and die on the arm of Trubisky at the moment. But if we're just looking at the wide receivers at the moment, how do you think they? Uh, how do you think they're going to stack up? Uh, I think they'd be closer to the middle of the pack, but. Again, I th- it would be hard Sorry. to be worse yeah. than last year, admittedly. It, it would be. It would be very hard. Um, they they don't have a ton of depth um, behind uh, behind Robinson and Miller. Like you could say Taylor Gabriel, he's a good third receiver. And yeah, he kind of is. Kevin White, maybe he'll turn out. Maybe he won't. Uh, he didn't last year. So, uh, you know, they've kind of got a similar depth problem as the Vikings. Um, but yeah, it's I, I think this brings them up as a as a total wide receiver unit closer to the middle of the pack uh and that was you know their glaring problem last year yeah that was definitely a definitely a glaring problem although uh it was kind of funny doing a little bit of research on this and they were talking about uh i believe it was a trey burton and how he's trying to bring a bit of the uh carson wentz magic to chicago and kind of like the Carson Wentz scheme, like wow, that's that's a thing. How long has he been in the uh, how, how long has he been in the league? Two years now, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, that Carson Wentz scheme. Yeah, it's it's that Carson Wentz scheme. You know, he got married. I was gonna ask what you got him for his uh, for his wedding. Oh, he knows. <laughs> was it the world's biggest umbrella, so you can just have shade on him all day? <laughs> Actually, that's not a bad idea. 
<laughs> so if you'd like to support the show, please go to Amazon and buy the biggest umbrella you can. <laughs> just put in the gift note from a reef and just send it directly over to. Let's see what what's their uh, what's the address for the uh, for the facilities <laughs> for the eagles. <laughs> Uh, let's, let's let's find out. Let's let's do some live show googling. <laughs> this will go well. So that is uh, that's going to be it for kind of talking about uh, the bears. So next episode we'll be talking about the lions and the insane amount of money that they are uh, paying for like three players. So good for them. Uh, <laughs> yeah! Hooray! Hooray! Uh, we are going to move on to the mailbag. We don't have a lot to talk about, but we did want to make sure we had a show, and uh, especially because we uh, have the training camp uh, guide coming up. So we wanted to kind of pump out as much of a show as we could. So we're going to go to the mailbag because we have a great mailbag this, uh, this episode. Uh, Luke Braun asks, who's the best player on the team that could be cut if they have a bad preseason? I've been thinking about this uh, a little bit because I saw this question, and it's kind of like it's a different – frame of the question that we get a lot, which is, you know, who's the surprise cut? Who's the best player that if they if they have a bad preseason could get cut? Right. Uh so like if for example Riley Reef has an awful preseason, still unlikely to get cut. Uh but, you know, if Terrence Newman, for example, has a really awful preseason, you could see him, you know, getting cut because they've got so much to deal with in that cornerback room in terms of like how many they're going to be able to keep on the roster. Uh, I think that's probably my, uh, my number one answer, but number two, maybe Marcus Sherrill's um, not because he's a talented corner or anything like that. Although I think he's maybe a little bit better than, uh, than he was a couple of years ago. So he's, he's actually not bad. It's like a fifth or sixth option, but I, you know, he's a really, really, really talented punt returner and a pretty talented a kick returner, and in a world where you've got Mike Hughes, who has the ability to do that, they brought in a bunch of returners. Uh, Chad Beebe, for example, is a part returner, and uh, I think Zilstra's a kick returner. Um, you know, Jeff Baddett's kind of both. Uh, they they brought in a couple of people that can that can replicate a lot of those duties. So I could see a scenario where where Marcus Sherrill's is the most talented player on the team that gets cut. What about uh, Kai Forbath, or were you not including that because you don't have a way of anal- of like breaking down uh, for analysis for kickers? Uh, I just I, it doesn't like it's not it's not so much that like I've got a good sense of how talented I think Kai Forbath is relative to the rest of the league, and he's a starting quality kicker. Um, but it's more like I didn't think of it because I don't think of it like you know it's like I just don't think of specialists like that. I guess Kai Forbath is probably the next best answer. Kai Forbath is people too. Uh, Connor asks, a reef yesterday projected that, uh, Stacy, uh, Stacy Coley doesn't make the 53 did some research and found some interesting information. He was running with the first team, uh, presumably ahead of Treadwell before being injured in minicamp. Am I missing something? Uh, yeah, I don't worry about where wide receivers are. Uh, when they're taking reps because uh, they rotate the receivers a lot. And so a lot of times you'll see receivers that you'd say are on the fourth team in reps with the first team. They just rotate receivers a lot uh, in OTAs and in training camp. You'll see this too. So for Stacey Coley to have p- played on the first team and then apparently get a little tweaked uh, or injured, um, that's actually not that unusual. So he wasn't even ahead of Treadwell. Uh, he just was playing – with the first team offense like receivers often do. So I, I wouldn't read too much into that. Brandon Zilstra had some reps with the first team too. It is just kind of a thing that happens. Uh, Coley, you know, and, and when, when the person asked this question, they also included a highlight from the preseason. Uh, Coley, uh, it wasn't good in the preseason last year. He has that highlight, which is great. Uh, and it shows a lot of the stuff that made him kind of a, an intriguing, uh, return option, but you know, he, he gets, and this is in the guide, uh, too, but he gets kind of bullied around a little bit too much in route. If a uh, defensive back has the ability to, to push him around, he, he does get pushed around. Um, you know, he's got pretty good ball tracking skills, you know, as a deep ball receiver, he's pretty fast, but you know, for the most part, he has a lot of difficulties, uh, getting open. So, you know, he didn't have a particularly great preseason, despite the fact that he had that highlight and him kind of quote unquote running with the ones is, is not that important. Um, it happens really only 
at the receiver position, you will see tight ends kind of rotate in there a little bit and running backs rotate in there a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, it's kind of receivers that you see uh, rotate a lot where it's kind of difficult to tell kind of who's first team and who's not. Next question we have is also from Connor who asks, with the team being loaded in the secondary, could we see a trade on loading a secondary piece uh, for offensive line help before the season, depending on how things look in the preseason? I could see it, I guess. Um, but I think if the team was in a spot where they thought it was, it, it'd be worth sacrificing some secondary talent for offensive line talent, they wouldn't have drafted Mike Hughes in the first. Like they, they already had an opportunity essentially to make that decision and they decided against. And now it is different, like trading your fourth corner. Like let's say, you know, a team's interested in Mac McKenzie Alexander, uh, and trading it for, you know, a sixth offensive lineman somewhere that has an opportunity to start, but can't on the team that he's on. But like, I, I get that, like that, that is a different calculus and value, but look, the way the Vikings have valued the secondary, I think they really appreciate having that many cornerbacks that can kind of step in. So I, I doubt it, but I'm not going to say it, it can't happen. It just seems like they had a similar opportunity and, and decided to forego it. After the fact, it would be more of like hedging a bet than anything else. It seems like, yeah, I think so. Uh, and, uh, and honestly, not that the preseason is like a bad time to, to, to make trades or anything like that. But I think if they were going to make that trade, uh, like McKenzie Alexander for, some sixth offensive lineman. They probably already would have by this point too. Yeah. Alex Goebel asks, let's say Kyle Sloter has a good training camp and looks even better in the preseason action. Denver calls before week one and offers to give back the fifth we spent on Simeon in exchange for him. What do you say? Yeah. I mean, all kinds of backup quarterbacks look good in the preseason. <laughs> it, it, it costs way less than a fifth to find someone who's going to look good in the preseason. Yeah. That said, Sluter had, a, like, I was watching for the guide, I was watching um, Sluter. He had a really tremendously good preseason uh, last year. So uh, I, I don't want to just say, ah, good preseasons happen all the time because that kind of, he's looked really good, which is kind of why the Vikings were so interested in him in the first place. Uh, and if he does it again, the Vikings will definitely want to you know, find a way to keep them. But I mean, I, developmental quarterbacks are usually not good. And fifth round picks, uh, although they don't usually turn into anything either, are usually more valuable. Um, so I would do it. Um, I'm kind of of the mind that if the if Kirk Cousins goes down, the Vikings are just like screwed and or they'll have magic occur again. Uh, and in neither of those scenarios require Kyle Sluter to be on the team. Um, so, yeah, I would do it. Um, whatever. <laughs> like, I just like the ending of that. Well, I mean, I'd do it, but yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a fit, it's we're not not talking about like, uh, would you, you know, trade a, a, a second round pick and like the next like three years of Stefan Diggs's career would be like, yeah, it's a fifth round pick, whatever. Uh, next question. I like this one. It's from Kenneth Allen who asks if you could Thanos snap any group of people from existence, which would you choose? So it's actually not Packers fans. I, you know, because it's like you get to, you get to see them because they're, they're about to, they're about to hit a wall, right, in the next couple of years when Aaron Rodgers is done and the Vikings consistently win the division. I want, I want to see that. I want to see them get hurt. Um, you can't Thanos snap someone and see them get hurt three years down the line. No, but you could still Thanos snap the group of uh, of uh, Packers Twitter who has decided to embrace the 38-7 uh, Eagles victory over the Vikings. Actually, I would just rather get rid of the Eagles. Like, the Packers doing it, it's like, that's not even your victory. No, no, but that's why it's more annoying, is the fact that it wasn't their victory, but in their mind it was. I, I'd still rather just be the Eagles fans who say it. That's too much. Like, <laughs> yeah, you won a Super Bowl, man. Celebrate that. Why aren't you harassing Patriots Twitter? And if you are, why are you spending so much time harassing both of our Twitters? You won. Like... That's ridiculous. That's weird. But they didn't, a Packers fan, I guess I can kind of understand because, like, they don't have anything. Like, they lost their quarterback for the season. Like, you didn't have anything. Your the team is a joke sometimes. So, okay, fine. 
But like, you won the Super Bowl. Chill out. Like, that's how I want to. So I would Thanos snap them. Outside of football, uh, I think everyone kind of knows what my answer is. Uh, um, so there, there's a question there. from the mailbag that we're not going to do, but um, yeah, I, I, I can. I kind of I kind of gathered that that would probably be it, but I I'm still of the belief that the Packers fans who or like fans who jump on um, other teams bandwagons just because like if it's like a division thing, I mean you know, Falcons fans making fun of the Saints fans after the Minneapolis miracle, I get I, I get that and that's fairly funny, but it's not something that continues on afterwards. Like it happens for like a day. You get over it, you're fine. But Packers fans in July messaging Vikings fans about 38 to 7, like, really? That you should probably learn a new dance step. Yeah, I guess I just I just like to feel like there's so many more opportunities to get back at Packers fans, right? And just be like <laughs> Well Yeah, and, I guess. What was the, your record last year? Ex- oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, you you had the first game in, in years where you didn't score any points? Wow, that must be tough for you. What's that like? I don't know. And plus, with the you know feeling bad about the Packers thing for a moment, there I was reading about the uh, the woman who's trying to get reelected and trying to make its law that uh, throughout the entire state of Wisconsin, you're able to watch the the Packers game. They just like ig- being able to ignore all like station programming and just making it so that throughout the whole state you're watching the Packers game when it's on and nothing else. So if that happens and the Packers start to suck again, which seems likely, um, (laughs) they'll just be forced to watch that instead of the conquering Vikings. So, I mean, it's kind of like they're getting snapped. They're just, you know, having to watch subpar stuff, which I'm totally fine with. Uh, Dan from Iowa. I like the I like the takeoff on this. Uh, who also says he is in fact Dan and is in fact from Iowa. So demand authenticity. He says uh, <laughs> we have about six outside corners and no obvious slot corner. What if against teams without an elite uh, number one receiver, Rhodes moves to the slot and nickel situations? He's probably our best slot corner. Then we could bring in Alexander or Hughes on the outside as the nickel corner. But either of those guys is better as a outside cor- uh, cornerback too than slot corner. What do you think? Uh, I think that this isn't a bad idea. Um, the the thing is, it sounds like Hughes is actually taking to the slot position really well. So uh, it's kind of kind of wait and see with Hughes. Um, but if Mackenzie Alexander like continues to to struggle with the slot position, and he actually I think he played better last year than a lot of people gave him credit for, including me, um, after I kind of rewatched a bunch of his games. Uh, and I've got that piece already up on zone coverage, so you can it's one of my most recent pieces. So you can see it there, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, Rhodes did follow number one receivers uh, when they moved into the slot, uh, starting like three years ago with Calvin Johnson and Larry Fitzgerald. Uh, and so when there is a there, when there is a number one receiver, he tends to go into the slot. Uh, the one thing I have to say about this is that slot targets don't produce as much for uh, offenses. And this is something I I didn't even think about thinking about a couple months ago, but Pro Football Focus has this article out about targets to outside receivers, targets to tight ends, targets to running backs, and targets to slot receivers. And targets to slot receivers just are not as important. And this could be for a variety of reasons, right? It could be that you have slot receivers run, uh, you know, shorter routes. It could be that slot receivers are always second or third in the progression, uh, which means you only pick on outside corners when you know you can win, whereas you pick slot corners when you know that the outside corner can't win, which means that you're not selecting the best targets for the slot corners. Uh, so, it, you know, there's a bunch of reasons that this could be the case. Um, but for now, I would probably say it is unlikely that um, a slot player is going to do as much damage as an outside player. So I would still take the hit at the slot position even though in terms of the total value of talent you have on the field, you're maximizing it by having potentially roads in the slot and, and Hughes on the outside or something like that. Um, you're putting players in positions where maybe you decrease the overall talent level. If maybe you, if, if Hughes isn't working at a slot corner and you put him at the slot. Uh, so I would say just because it's, there's such a substantial difference between uh, 
the value that a slot position produces and an outside position produces, I would just prioritize protecting that outside corner first. But I don't hate the idea. Uh, because I do think Rhodes has demonstrated uh, a lot of good ability in the slot. Is it one of those things where Rhodes would be able to do it for like the first half of the season and then have uh, have Hughes kind of follow uh, follow up for the for the second half? Uh, maybe um, kind of as he gets more comfortable, speed right, of the game yeah. and whatnot. One of the, one of the things that's and you know when Rhodes is following a number one receiver, you know he's going to just follow the number one receiver kind of right. regardless of where he goes. So you'll have slot rotations for for Hughes throughout that first half of the season, even with that plan. One of the things is that Hughes is just picking up the defense. Apparently, again, this is all according to coach reports and coaches lie, but. Uh, Zimmer tends to be kind of honest, like when he said that it was a mistake to put Trey Waynes in the slot back when he was a rookie. Um, so, you know, there's there's like seeds of truth. And he says that Hughes has picked up the defense faster than any defensive back that he's, you know, worked with. I think he said something very similar to that or something as superlative as that. So I'll try to link that. Um, but maybe you don't even have to bring him along. Uh, maybe uh, you can just uh, have him play in the slot right away. Or you can do what Terrence Newman and Mackenzie Alexander did, uh, which is that they rotated uh, and I remember earlier I mentioned uh, this is like weeks and weeks, maybe months ago. I mentioned I couldn't figure out what the um, pattern was for the rotation. Uh, and someone, I think Nicholas Olson on Twitter was like, "Hey, have you checked out? Um, you know whether or not it happened more often on third down or on running plays or something like that, or, or even he just said it happened more often on third down or running plays." And I don't actually think that that's it. Although I do think that there was that tendency. I think it was much more likely that you'd have. Um, Terrence Newman out there if there was a significant chance of a run. Um, but I don't think that that pattern held very as consistently as, as usual. Either way, you could still have Hughes out there or Mac out there um, based on situation or matchup or just, you know, testing to see who, who's better. Um, and you could do that, too. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of options. Uh, and we should kind of be open to the idea that because Rhodes is the best slot corner, also the best corner, um, maybe sometimes it is appropriate to put him in the slot when there's nobody to to shadow. So our next question is going to be from uh, Mo Sav, and a bit of a philosophy question, uh, but asks, why doesn't the NFL have a softer cap like the NBA? Also, why aren't there exceptions and other provisions like the mid-level and biannual for teams strapped against the cap? A, I think uh, like mid-level exceptions and and super maxes and all that. Uh, that's just way too complicated. I don't want to deal with that for the NFL, especially when you've got uh, well, like fifty-one players that count towards the cap and fifty-three on uh, the roster and and sixty-three including the practice squad. That's way different than like eleven, right? Like eleven players on an NBA or ten players on an NBA team. Like that's way easier to keep track of these like like bird rules or whatever they are uh for figuring out the cap space of of players uh the second is i don't know what a soft cap gets you uh so like what like you'd have to figure out what's the point of a salary cap and there's a bunch of different arguments like one of the points is that it limits the total amount of money that the players can make and that's good for owners so hooray uh, but the second argument that's not related to, you know, who gets to win a labor negotiation, who gets the majority of the money, uh, is that it enforces some level of league parity. Now, if you put a soft cap where uh, you have uh, a luxury tax, uh, I mean, the Cowboys are just going to blow the cap up every year anyway, because they don't have to worry about the luxury tax. I mean, they've got tons of They're the most valuable team in the NFL. So uh, you still kind of exacerbate these parity problems. Um I, I just I don't see a compelling argument for why you would have a soft cap um, other than it is good to, to have to for players to get more money, in which case you just raise the salary cap. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it doesn't seem like that's that important to me. No. Uh, next question is from Corey Ruge. He says, if you could build a quarterback to defeat our defense, what trades would that look or what uh, traits would that look like? Also, who in the NFL best resembles that quarterback, and would they be a real threat? Um, the problem with this question, so I was thinking about this question, and I started like building a quarterback in my mind, and I was like, wait, this is just the perfect quarterback. It's not different. Uh, um, like, how do you take advantage of a Zimmer defense? Well, it's not like it's a it's a you know a Tampa two defense where you want a quarterback that's particularly good. 
uh, at attacking the seams, right? It's not like it's a cover three defense where you want a quarterback that is like particularly good uh, at, uh, you know, attacking the, the robber position or whatever. Like it, it doesn't matter. Like it's a, it's a very versatile, complex defense that'll run cover two, cover one, cover three, cover six, cover four, whatever it needs to at any particular point uh, in order to get things done. And it can run both zone and man. So like, how do you beat that? Well, you, you make the defense wrong. Like you, uh, recognize defensive. So you need a quarterback that's like good at pre-snap reads and is really accurate and has a really strong arm to take advantage of, uh, some of the tight windows that might be left open because otherwise the cornerbacks have really great coverage. You want a quarterback that's really good under pressure. You want a quarterback that, uh, is athletic because the Vikings have consistently had problems with quarterbacks that can execute the zone read very effectively. Um, but like, when aren't those things good things to have in a quarterback? So it's really, it's just like the perfect quarterback. Like it's an athletic quarterback with a big arm. That's really accurate. That reads defenses really well. Makes sure defenses wrongs. Ha- it makes sure defenses are wrong. Uh, has uh, a good command of the offense has control of the line of scrimmage and can identify what the defense is doing before the defense executes it and change the play. Um, they need to have enough of an ego to try and make those tight window throws, but not enough of an ego that they won't check into a run when it's necessary. And, um, that's the perfect quarterback. Like it's not unique to, to beating the Vikings. Um, so, you know, what would they need to be better again against a Vikings defense than another kind of defense? Uh, I guess, I guess zone reads I, I, that still bothers me as a Vikings fan. Um, so maybe a little bit better at making those reads or being a little more athletic, uh, you know, when, when pulling the ball and running, um, uh, maybe a little bit better at finding ways to attack match coverages, uh, which, um, you mean, you can find, uh, with quarterbacks that are willing to run crossers and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's, it's not that different. And like the answer is Aaron Rodgers. like he's accurate. He's, he's got a strong arm. He's athletic. He can run the zone reads if, if that's what he wants to do. Uh, he's smart, like, yep, that's him. And I think we're forgetting the the whole scramble aspect of things, which the Vikings still have a, a bit of a problem trying to uh, stop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when when quarterbacks are flushed out of the pocket, sometimes the Vikings cornerbacks have difficulty keeping up on scramble drills. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is the best in the NFL at the scramble drill. Uh, obviously, you have to have your receivers in tune, but the, the Packers seem to drill that um, pretty well. So, uh, yeah. I mean, that's another aspect of that. So really, it's Aaron Rodgers with better receivers. Yeah, that's the that's the Vikings' potential weakness. Aaron Rodgers with a healthy collarbone and better receivers. <laughs> oh. oh. Well, uh, you can't beat him with a bad call. Wait, where's the lie? <laughs> it's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just driving that point home. I get it. Uh, Matt McKeon asks, which is the worst rule, soccer's intentional handball or the NFL's catch rule? Uh, I don't know that much about soccer. I just made a lot of money off of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really a doctor, but I, let, I watch a lot of house. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's lupus. Um, Never lupus. I, I don't know, man. With, with the, the problem with the intentional handball rule is that it's like an automatic ejection if the referee determines that in your heart of hearts you wanted to interfere with the ball. Like, yeah, it's pretty shitty, I guess. <laughs> um, whatever. <laughs> that, I mean, that's like. But like the catch rule is is refined every year to the point now where the the rules the the the, the changes that were made this year I still am not a hundred percent on and won't be a hundred percent on until like week fifteen. I'm never going to be on it. Well, and then in week 16, you're going to see like some obvious catch rule, not a catch. You're like, ah, well, never mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we get to go back to Vikings Twitter and be like, what is a catch anyway? Yeah, right. Troll somebody uh, saying that Des caught it. You know what? Uh, yeah, I mean, the revision to the catch rule happens. So let's go with the intentional handball rule. Red cards are pretty bad. So that's. I mean, they're that, red. That swings a game. I mean, yeah, they're red. I mean, how much worse can you get? Exactly. Uh, those swing games probably more than. Bad catch calls do. Well, probably. Kyle Slaby asks, which 2018, or sorry, which 27 Vikings quarterback is most likely to beat the 2018 team and somehow destroy our season either before or during the playoffs? Uh, Taylor Heineke. Um, <laughs> there. Take boom. that. 
Vikings should have paid him and also kept him, or so, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> who's who's the undrafted quarterback they had last year? Mitch Leidner. There you go. There's your answer. Yeah, I was gonna say I think Mitch Leidner is the is the only one that that could be. <sighs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, probably Bradford, but I just I'm just gonna say Teddy because I want to say Teddy. <laughs> You'd feel less bad about it being Teddy destroying it than uh, than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, if the NFL Network is predicting the Packers go sixteen and zero and the Bears go fifteen and one, does that stand to follow that the Vikings, a better overall team, will go nineteen and zero? Yeah, I can't. I can't see any flaws in this logic. So <laughs> it has to be. Yeah, um, I mean. Yeah, there's no contradictions. Uh, you can't logically tease out any inconsistencies. So yeah, no, there you go. That makes sense, especially that 15 and one for the Bears. It's gonna be yeah. dangerous. Uh, how many touchdowns will future All Pro Laquan Treadwell have in 2018? His breakout year. I don't think they award All Pros to special teamers, but. Um... <laughs> Pro Bowl, right? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm currently Googling up uh, North American burn centers. <laughs> that was, I mean, that was, that was rude of me. I, I am better than that. Are you? Because um, I'm start. I, 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 I don't, I don't know if that's accurate. I, I know I'm better than that because they do award all pros to special teamers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Matthew Slater has like four first team all pros. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, touchdowns, uh, I don't know, like two? Maybe. It's an infinite percent increase. That is, actually. I'm still going with the, uh, with the zero, but if, if you want to be that, uh, that full of hope, I was recently just told. Call me, just call me a Laquan Treadwell optimist. <laughs> is that what we call Dude, you? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, there's, who there's is lots more of... faith than me who predicts two touchdowns for a guy who's never scored a touchdown? You're like the guy who goes on that first bet, or the the bet for for the Super Bowl as to who's gonna like get the first uh, get the first touchdown, and it's like the guy you're the guy who like picks the fullback, or like the fat <laughs> offensive lineman who's gonna pick up a fumble and bring it in, like the astronomical yeah, right. odds. <laughs> Arif has ten bucks on Laquan Treadwell with two touchdowns. The payout is gonna be like ninety million dollars. Yeah, what, what does Kevin from the office say? Whenever you see 10,000 to 1 odds, you have to take it. <laughs> you have to. You have to. Uh, Don from Ohio asks, best way to cook corn on the cob? This is uh, where it turns out you don't like corn, isn't it? No, I love corn. Uh, the problem is that there's, like, multiple best ways, and they, like, interfere with one another. But my take is uh, you roast the corn on the cob inside tin foil in butter, paprika, salt, pepper, uh, most of the way through. And then when it's nearly done, uh, just you know, scorch the outside. Um, not black, but like a really quick outside. Because I, like, I like the taste of having it kind of boil in butter. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I also love the the char that you get on the outside, and it's difficult to have both at once. So basically, direct uh, heat for like a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, but most of it'll be cooked inside with butter. But yeah, direct heat for like a minute. I can get behind the uh, I can get behind the tin foil. You don't necessarily need it. You can just put it like on the husks and uh, and go indirect on it. But my biggest thing is the addition of cowboy butter to it. And kind of basting it in cowboy butter, or making sure that cowboy butter ends up getting put on afterwards. Are you? This sounds like a really disgusting euphemism. What is cowboy butter? I actually have the recipe pulled up here. Uh, it is a cup of melted butter, juice of half a lemon, two cloves garlic, one shallot, a uh, little bit of Dijon mustard. I don't like horseradish, but you can put it in. Uh, some cayenne, some paprika, some parsley, some chives, thyme, some kosher salt, and some pepper. And That's just, a lot of ingredients, but it sounds delicious. Oh, it's so good. You could put cowboy butter on basically anything, but uh, yeah, on uh, on corn, it's just it, it takes it to a, a fantastic level. I am a big proponent of cowboy butter. Finally, it feels like we got asked this question like way too late into the summer. <laughs> I know, right? Like, well, there's still there's still a few months left of you know 
cooking out next to your meth RV. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> The HVAC repairman asks us, what is the weirdest spreadsheet Arif has created? So I saw this question and I've been like going through my spreadsheets to see what the answer is. So if I knew this question was going to be asked of me like three years ago, I would have like, as I saved spreadsheets, been like, oh, yeah, I should I should think about this going in as like one of my weird ones. But like now I'm just I've got like hundreds of spreadsheets and I'm not like interested in reading the titles to all of them, but I will say I've got spreadsheets that I have just labeled unknown. Uh, so there's that, uh, which weird is that one of them has unknown two has the formula for passer rating. And so whenever I need to create a new spreadsheet that calculates what passer rating is, uh, I just open unknown to and copy and paste it. Cause it's way faster than like manually figuring out this dumb formula for a stupid, uh, stat that people want to have. Um, but yeah, I've got a couple of unknowns. I've got a don't know what this is. Um, a who knows. <laughs> There's a who knows. I like that one. Yeah. It's actually like rocket fuel or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've got, let's see, Carson Wentz versus pressure. Uh, yeah. I must have had a vendetta. Did you say pressure something. or predator? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would watch that and probably log it in a spreadsheet. <laughs> like, did he did he see the shimmer was that the thing that did he catch that out of the corner of his eye before it attacked i've got some for like very specific arguments i was having like drone bettis versus backups like i don't i don't think drone bettis deserves to be in the hall of fame i was arguing with somebody and someone was like well check how he did versus how his backups did so i did um you know whatever it's not that important <laughs> <laughs> you were in an argument on the internet and you had to be right. Therefore, a spreadsheet had to be created. Yeah, it just emerged uh, kind of naturally. <laughs> like the morning nature. dew. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, I've got 2016 CFL stats. That's a thing. <laughs> um, How detailed is that? Uh, it, it can't be that detailed. <laughs> I was going to say, are we, are we talking like, does it get oh past? Like, this is the least detailed spreadsheet I have. Uh, it's uh, 17 rows and uh, it's four columns. Uh, rank, name of quarterback, team quarterback plays on, and his adjusted yards per attempt. That's it. That's Nothing all else. it is. You got yards per attempt and what team they played on, basically. Yeah. Uh, so Trevor Harris was the best quarterback to play in the 2016 CFL season, according to adjusted yards per attempt. And I remember when I made this spreadsheet, I was like, honestly, adjusted yards per attempt doesn't make for the, is a sense for the CFL because we don't know what the touchdown and interception value should be. So it's not even like good at the thing, the one very specific thing it does for the 17 quarterbacks it ranked. Now, just a reminder, people, that if you want this information like this, you can go to the paywall at Zone Coverage, where a reef is full of all sorts of these useful pieces of information. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we asked you to go deep into the uh, deep into the uh, into the spreadsheet hell and uh, and find something good. So, no, you. I think you delivered on this one. You you found all of the CFL goodness, <laughs> which was not a phrase I was expecting to say in this uh, this episode of the show. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's just a lack of preparation on your part, isn't it? <laughs> now it's back on me, huh? <laughs> I give you I give you cowboy butter, and you give me this. It's ridiculous. All right, so uh, that is wait, going to be. Wait, I found it. I found the weirdest spreadsheet. Oh, we have it. We have it. It's labeled injury simulator, and when I opened it, it gives me an ethanol percentage by volume. And I don't know why I <laughs> needed to know ethanol percentage by volume. Uh, the R squared is 0. 0.9983 of ethanol percentage by volume. And this is about injury. I mean, that's what the title is. It clearly is not. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I title it that? What's have, oh, it's a linear formula. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> is this is this like when somebody puts like a porn folder on their computer and they like label it as specifically not porn? 
<laughs> not point. Oh, oh, there are injury values here. It's just on other sheets. Why? Well, you had to keep the ethanol formula. You you must have been very proud of that. I I, I guess. Uh, yeah, here's just a bunch of numbers uh, that are not labeled. Oh, I've got a good guess for what those numbers are. Uh, it's you're uh, gonna go back to this one like right yeah, after the show and just be like, okay, so. Crazy. So it looked at the injury rates for every team between 2014 and 2016, and also how much ethanol is in a certain volume. Those two things separately, it did those things. I, I feel like if this was a good spreadsheet, it would actually find a way to, to figure these two things together. Uh, yeah, I mean, that you'd figure that, I guess, you idiot. <laughs> I'm not the idiot with the spreadsheet that doesn't do it. Uh, yeah, okay, fair enough. So that is going to be it for uh, for the show. Um, we've already done it, uh, but why don't you go ahead and uh, do one more plug for the guide? Uh, yeah. So uh, once again, uh, the uh, the promo code to purchase the paywall is my name A R I F, uh, and that makes it twenty dollars to buy uh, the uh, access to the paywall, which gives you access to the zone coverage. Uh, training camp guide, and that training camp guide gives you a scouting report on all 86 players that are not the long snapper, kicker, or punter. Um, and it gives you an understanding of their strengths, their weaknesses, what they did last year, and their context, how they fit on the team. Uh, and uh, also, you get access to a couple of special articles, like what it means to draft a developmental offensive lineman. Uh, and uh, and I do some breakdowns on kind of what to expect from John Filippo's offense and stuff like that. If you have enjoyed the show, you can go to paypal.me slash norsecode, or you can go to patreon.com slash norsecode and throw us a couple bucks that way. Again, we really do appreciate it. You can also just share the show. We are available on Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, the uh, awful Apple iPhone and uh, iTunes uh, podcast area, which I was actually just reading. There's like two people who work for that whole thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, for that entire thing. So if that guy doesn't like you, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> so Complain to the other guy. Yeah, you know, you work, you try to, you try to you know, get them against each other. <laughs> that's how that's supposed to work anyway. Uh, so we are going to have another episode here coming up again shortly. Um, but again, if you enjoy the show, please uh, spread it to a friend. And that is going to be it for this episode. So for Arif, my name is James. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, as Stefan Diggs says, don't stop playing until the clock hits zero. And we will see you soon. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at NorseCodeDN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash NorseCode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash NorseCode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. 